So, I'm, I'm, well, my name is Claudio Aguilar, and I, I am a biochemist by, by training, and so a biologist, maybe, by, by necessity. And um, so, I realize it's normal that we speak somewhat different scientific languages. So, I'll do my best to try to be as clear as possible. Um, so, I apologize in advance if there is too much background, and I apologize if there is not enough background. So please stop me whenever you think convenient that's needed so that I can clarify everything. Because I want to convince you that biology needs you. And then the best way, the best thing you can do for biology is collaborate with me. That's the best thing you can do. So our lab is interested in the mechanisms, studying the mechanism of some cellular processes, particularly endocytosis, which I'll define in a second. Uh, particular in stages of uh, states of health and disease. Um, how do we do what we do? So essentially, we focus our studies in mouse, like ourselves, humans, and also in more uh, simple organisms, like uh, yeast, in the case of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So in order to study these uh, this, uh, uh, subjects, we use a different kind of tools that we borrow from many other different disciplines, like molecular biology, biochemistry, cell biology. So how do we uh, connect cell biology and, and medicine? What's our approach to medical issues? So essentially, as cell biologists, we don't focus on patients as a whole. So we don't even actually pay too much attention to organs, although we're interested in. We zoom in onto cells in this particular case, neurons. And actually, more than the whole cell, many times we are interested in particular structures within the cell, like the synapse in this case. So the same uh, rationale can actually be applied to other organs, and, and therefore it leads us to focus on two different cell types with different functions and different specializations. Let's focus a little bit on the synapse. Uh, I know you all must be familiar with uh, artificial neural networks and try to establish a parallel with you desperately. And, and essentially, uh, as you know, artificial neural networks uh, use uh, neurons, uh, these computing units that connect among each other and transfer messages. So as you also may know, this uh, paradigm is actually inspired in real neural networks. And essentially these uh, uh, networks actually are capable of modifying the strength of their connections and the, actually the ability to transfer messages uh, similarly to what the artificial neural net networks do. And actually that's a process called neuronal plasticity. And um, actually the connections in between real neurons is the synapse that I described a few seconds ago. So how do neurons talk to each other? How do send, they send messages to each other? So essentially, if we zoom in even more, what we're gonna see is that an input neuron is actually containing some vesicles that contain a biochemical compound called neurotransmitter. And the uh, output neuron actually contains certain proteins on the surface that are capable of binding those neurotransmitters. So upon a stimulation, the neurotransmitter is released, and eventually it hit and binds one of the receptors in the output neuron and it, it stimulates a response. So that's the way by which neurons transmit so messages. So what electricity is coming here? Oh, sorry? Elect there is some electrical signal. Exactly. So what is coming mm -hmm. here? Yeah, I mean, one of the potential responses to this binding here is the change in potential. For example, the open up of channels that allow the exchange of ions and change the potential of the neuron. Absolutely. So how, how is this the strength of the connection modified, similar to what you guys do with neural net, artificial neural networks. So one of the mechanisms that contribute to this is uh, the retrieval, the control of the concentration of these receptors on the memory. The less receptors you have, the less sensitive it's gonna be to the message. The more receptor it has, it's gonna become more sensitive to the message. It's gonna be able to catch it up immediately. So one of the things that happens is that certain proteins, intracellular proteins like one, I'm gonna introduce just a few names, like drugs, 
One is called Epsin, it's, it's really close to our heart, and essentially it, it's able to interact with these receptors in the interior of the cell. So let's understand a little bit, you are saying that we have more receptors, does it mean that we have higher voltage or not? So what it, does it mean more? What, what more it means is that it's capable of sensing more of these molecules outside. So let's say if you have only one receptor here, you're only going to be able to read one of these messages. So it's like parallel, you Yeah, exactly, exactly. So and and there is well, there is a there is a complex relationship between binding and the response. It's a sigmoidal curve, and so there's a saturation effect as well. So it's a maximum that there can be. A, a thing. Um, so we can control that by by modifying this this concentration of receptors on the surface. And these proteins, Epsin, and these adapter proteins, or AP, it's a family of proteins, are capable of binding to these receptors and actually promoting the retrieval of these receptors out of the surface. They encapsulate these receptors in a vesicle and remove them from the plasma membrane. So what we see here is a decrease immediately in the sensitivity of this cell to the message. Okay, so that's one way of modifying the uh, sensitivity. And that is uh, is analogous to what you guys do when the, you train the network and actually it increases the strength of the weight of this particular connection. So I still don't understand what do you mean by sensitivity? What is it actually? The ability to read the message. So if you eventually have zero receptors, you don't receive the message. The it's more not about the value of the signal. Is that true? It's, it's about what? It's not about the value of the signal. How? How? It's about the ability to read the signal, to, read. to receive the message. Yeah. So this process of removing things from the surface of the cell and including them in these vesicles is what uh, we call endocytosis or internalization. So it internalizes this inside of the cell. Okay, that's what I call it. So, and this is a property that is shared pretty much by all the cells in the organism. It it, it, it's not only for neurons, it's not only for synapses. It's actually essential for life. So, in recent years, there has been an explosion in the technology that we, are, we, we can access to if we have money enough. And essentially, it allows us to really have a really sophisticated images of these cells, and it allows us to actually uh, uh, collect incredible amounts of information. But the problem is that the methods for the analysis of that information are way behind. So the technology is, is really blooming, and we have a lot of new techniques every month almost, uh, uh, but the methods to analyze the data is our uh, weak point so far. So this technology it actually allows us, for example, to uh, observe more than one molecule, more than one of these receptors at this, as it is removed from the plasma membrane. Let's assume that we can somehow label these receptors with two different colors. We, we use fluorescence, so they are they fluoresce. But uh, let's say one are green, the other ones are red. So, so can, you, can you tell us why do you want to do it? What's the goal? We want to we want to study. Uh, I'm going to go down into a second, but what we want is to understand how this happens. What are the mechanisms that actually uh, act on these receptors to sort them, to remove them, to not to remove them, to release them to the plasma membrane? But when, when like an organ is removed, it is for some reason, it's for some goal. What, does it, what, the, what is done? Well, like? in, uh, the example I gave is just for the neuronal uh, plasticity. In other cases, for example, if this is certain receptors that are responsive to proliferation cues, for example, when there are too many of these guys, you get cancer, for example. So one of the things, that, and, and actually many cancers are, I'm gonna actually mention that a little bit in a second, but uh, they have the impossibility to remove these guys. So they keep on receiving messages and they keep on informing to the cell, let's divide, let's divide, and let's keep on doing it. And that's what it derives in a tumor formation in a cancer. So, so this technology allows us to see the fate of these guys, so we're going to see that following internalization, we're going to have some some of these vesicles which are going to be green, some of them are going to be red, and some of them are going to be a mixture of both colors. So if we actually look at what we're going to see is this: so some of the vesicles are red, some are green, and when they have both, they com the the combination of the colors get yellow. 
Okay? So we can see that. So this is a cartoon, it's a very optimistic cartoon because the reality looks more like this. So there is a lot of noise and there is a full definition many times and there is some blurring of the images. So there is a lot of effort on trying to generate uh, systems that can actually clean the noise and detect some patterns here. So, for example, this is one attempt. I think uh, I'm going to try. Well, anyway, I, I don't think you can see very well here, but the, the noise has been reduced, and uh, we can analyze some of these structures in more detail. And actually, there have been some analysis that have been trying to be developed to try to measure how many of these we have versus these versus the ones that contain both. So, and, but, but we are very primitive still on this kind of analysis. We definitely need to improve in the identification and filtering of the noise, in the measuring of the intensity of these signals, and in the ability to detect and quantify these patterns. So for example, when we have a person that has a disease, like cancer, like another uh, diseases I'm going to mention. So these patterns might be altered, but we don't know what to look at yet. So we need methods to detect those uh, abnormal patterns. And also, as I mentioned, this uh, technology allows to actually collect piles of data. So it needs to be fast. So we need to be able to go through piles of images. So I, 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 I can now really tell you how many gigas and gigas and gigas per minute <laughs> to generate in the lab of this. So why is this important? So we want to learn how this works because of the implications in, in diseases. So essentially we want to have very powerful tools for the analysis of these patterns and so on. Then the idea of what we do is to introduce perturbations in the system, target a particular protein, for example, a particular gene, and see what happens. And then we learn how these things work. That's the idea. And by several cycles of this analysis and perturbation, we learn how things work. And I'm going to show you some examples of how that happens. Essentially, that's going to lead us uh, to gain information about how these things work in health and disease. And, uh, and actually, this uh, uh, implication of genes and proteins led me to discuss another form of information that we still struggle to understand, and which is the information contained in the proteins themselves, not just in the cellular process, but the proteins. So let, let me to very, very briefly discuss what is the central dogma of biology, and essentially is that one gene uh, produces one protein or a polypeptide. Um, it's a very simplistic way, but the information is transferred from DNA onto protein in a unidirectional way. So, and then these proteins, proteins are these little spheres here, represent as a string, are amino acids. So they are biochemical units that make proteins. And they have a particular biochemical structure. So, um, a protein then is the sum of all these amino acids, okay, in a particular sequence. So there are 20 amino acids in nature that we use. And uh, of course, it would be very difficult to describe this protein in terms of the individual structures so we assign a letter to each of them. So we created an alphabet. It's the amino acid alphabet. So therefore, in this protein that you can see here can be described in terms of an alphabet. And that alphabet makes a word. Okay, so the information for the function, the structure, and so on, of this protein is contained here. Okay? And actually that's way easier than trying to describe this protein by putting all these amino acids together and generating a very complex structure. So we believe that these sequences, these words that we can make out of proteins, contains very important information. For example, if we go back to our receptors and we put on the sequence, the, this, uh, these words here, um, uh, we, we can uh, intuitively believe that the information for their behavior, for their endocytosis, for example, is encoded here. And actually, that was first uh, described by uh, uh, Joe Dawson and Mike Brown, uh, which they won the Nobel Prize in 1985, because they figured that this letter Y here is critical for endocytosis to occur. Okay? 
So, and actually, it's critical because the family of adaptor proteins, the proteins that I mentioned very, very early on, are kin of this letter, and they go and stick to it. Okay. Actually, what they described was the uh, LDL receptor, which is the low-density lipoprotein. This is the bad cholesterol, the thing that worries me so much, and uh, I try to combat with my lipitor. So. This thing allows this receptor binds to the bad cholesterol, and the bad cholesterol is internalized, is removed from the bloodstream. Okay? Now, what they found, and that's because they are a family of adapter proteins that recognize the letter Y. They found that there, is a, there were families, there were patients, that actually spontaneously have a mutation in the letter Y, and they have a C instead. So the adapter proteins cannot read a letter C. Okay, so they will not interact, they will not remove LDL, the bad cholesterol will accumulate in the bloodstream. Okay, that was the, the familiar hypercholesterolism. So this is an immediate consequence for the concept of endosteroids. So, okay, so we have some clues. We know that the letter Y is important. We know that we, if we look at many different receptors, like in neurons, in hepatocytes, in other different cells, many of the receptors have a Y there. Okay, so essentially our prediction then is that we're going to have the famous endocytosis event that I described before. Okay, so we're going to have some vesicles contain one, the other, and some of them are going to contain both. However, in many cases we see that that's not the case. So that actually there are vesicles that only contain green and there are others that are only red. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is that this is the message that is encoded in this sequence in this world here is way more complex. The letter Y is very important, but it's not the whole thing. There is something else in, the, in this world here that says this guy needs to go here. He cannot be mixed up with the other one. Okay, we see that all the time. So other letters may contribute to the, the, the content, to the information that these proteins carry. So what we did time ago was actually trying to figure it out, what was the message, by actually messing up with the message. So we actually randomized all the letters, mixed them up, and tried to see what happened. So and by randomizing, you mean actually you play with removing one of the... Exactly, them. genetically so changing them. So you can them. actually target one protein now? Yes. And yes. You should, okay. So we, we actually mixed them up, all the, all the letters, and we generated like 10 to the 9 different combinations. Okay, and we try to look at them and see what happened. And essentially, one of the keys was to try to see if the famous AP proteins were able still to recognize these these Y letters, or there were combinations with these other letters that were lethal for the interaction. But you kept the Y there. Yeah, Y was always kept. We tried to figure out the rest of the answers. So that was collected in two publications that were published in 1998 and 2001. Okay, the data. Very complex data. I'm not going to go through the details here, but here there are a lot of words and a lot of binding results, which I'm not going to discuss the technology here. I'll be more than happy if anybody is interested. But we have tons of data. But essentially, I had to admit that the results were very complicated. So we figured out certain generalities. But what exactly the world was saying was very difficult to extract. There were some, even not contradictions, but they are very complicated semantic going on in this world so they, that we cannot understand. But you, have, so, but you find out that certain combination is exactly. not right in certain Exactly, but we don't know why. Because, for example, in one case, there was like the preference of the letter P in this position, along with there's a preference for the letter S in the other position. But if you put them together, it doesn't work. So there are a lot of rules of semantic there that we don't understand. So what was the problem? The problem was that we, we could get results, but we could not make any prediction. So the predictive power of this, the ability to derive rules, I said, each time that we get this, this is what is going to happen, was really weak. Because these combinations we never really completely understood. And it's not until very recently that, our, actually in our lab, uh, we generated this 
uh, we decided to apply a, a artificial neural network and say, okay, we don't understand how this happened, but let the network learn and do the predictions. And actually that works pretty well. So actually it works with, with great accuracy. We can predict what is gonna happen with the problem. But, they, but, but still we're not satisfied because we can predict, but we don't understand. We want to understand how these letters are combined, what the letters say, why, and what, what kind of rules apply. Mm -hmm. We don't know. And, so, uh, so, like I understand, so what does this neural what does it give it to you? The, the, the result. So this, uh, that, uh, let me go back to the previous slide. Since I'm the last to understand it, so you will have a lot of questions for me. So, so as I said, there is a family of these problems. Some of them bind to certain words and not to others. So, and that makes this protein go to one place versus this other goes to a different place and so on. We can now predict what protein is gonna be bound by AP1 or by AP2, by AP3, and not for it by AP3A. So that allows us- Is that different APs? Yes, it's a family of proteins. So based on that, we can figure out where the protein is gonna end up. Okay. But, but you didn't answer the question. You have one APO, the only one, let's say AP1, mm -hmm. and you mess up the word, and you want to say... But we messed up the words here, okay? Yeah, this yes. word, you mess it up, and yeah. you only ask the following question. Does AP bind or not? Exactly. Could, could you... Yeah, we can, we can address that. Could, we can predict that. Do you know that. the answer? Yes. We can predict that with the use of the network, or the, uh, the artificial network. neural network. Otherwise, we cannot, because... The results are extremely complex. We don't understand. We spend a lot of time. I mean, as I said, the last paper was in 2001. I mean, 2010 we submit this, but of course, I mean, we are, I mean, I, I will, even if you ask me, I will not show you my code because uh, I'll be a, a shame of it. But so we, we are not good at this. Uh, but on top of that, we need to stop doing what we do, what we think we do better. So, so we need experts. To actually tell them. Just a couple of quick questions, yes, please. Uh, technical questions. Using a, a, a sigmoid activation function? We, we did use that, yes. And how, how many, this is about standard back propagation? Yes. And how many game nodes? Uh, that is shown here, too. As shown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't try too many. We tried a couple of configurations, and this was the one that learned faster. Yeah. But and again, I'm sure I'm sure yeah, maybe there were tons yeah. of better combinations than the one we chose. So so the question is, are you convinced that that actually there is a word or there is a the, the information is the permutation of the word, or maybe there are some physical properties uh, uh, that that are more than just the combination of the word. Well, well you, one thing is is the, is the same thing. What you're saying is the same thing. So we encode different biochemical units with a letter. Okay. Those biochemical units have different physical properties. So that's that's hidden behind this code. Okay. So, so that for example, are, this. The letters are all what you need. What's that? Sorry? The letters are all what you need. Exactly. Yeah. So this encodes certain physical properties that this guy doesn't have. For example. So it's encoded. No, the question that I'm asking, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I understand, when you have this word, uh, there is some folding, yes. And this folding, actually, is this... You're this, talking about protein folding? Yeah, for example, is this... So it depends on some physical, some hydrogen bond, whatever. Yes. So this permutation will lead to a different structure. So the question that they ask, I'm asking whether permutation of the word is I would call it a first order approximation or linear structure is what you're looking for. Or maybe you are looking for the secondary structure when the land Absolutely. The, you, it, you it, can, it, it can be it can be like that. But the problem is that we don't even know exactly if there is a privilege or a favor uh, confirmation of this. Mm -hmm. However what they found is that they see they, they develop something which seems to be able to predict that effectively. But it could so, be that the permutation yeah. leads to the same structural property, and then the structure is actually what actually the hidden, the hidden variables. So yeah. That, yes. What yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The, I mean, what does the work? Yeah. Yes. And that's why, and probably there are many permutations that might lead to a similar. Something that, that yeah, I, I I I agree. I mean, and that, and that's the complexity of this 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 thing. So. 
Yeah, so how long does that training take? The time you train is, uh, although it's two nodes in a hidden layer, how long does it take? I, I, I don't know, I don't recall exactly, but uh, I, I will be uh, ashamed to tell you. Maybe the, the way we did it is not the proper way. So I don't recall, honestly, that's my okay. only okay. answer. But it doesn't necessarily mean that was properly done. Do you find that permissible structures in other organisms? Say that in crocodiles, it's one thing, then in dinosaurs, it's another one. So, so as far happen. as we can tell, mammals mm -hmm. seems to be the same. As far as we can tell, that's what we have studied. We have studied humans, we have studied rat, mouse, uh, examples of these. Well, and they seem to be working the same. structures into the same case. case. But, so if you run all your permissible structures into the data, do you find those? Some of them can be found. Some of them were just combinatorial. Mm -hmm. So essentially, <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that we can predict, but we're not satisfied with that. We will, we will let you learn a little bit and give answers to Bartik on what he's asking. So we want to know why. So, so we want to be able to understand a little bit more how this works. Um, if we go back to, to this problem, so we have been talking about how this family of proteins recognize the receptors. I mentioned there is another protein involved in this process. And then I will let you focus on it for a second. So actually, a few years back, somebody did also some kind of analysis of the information content in the Epsin molecule. And actually, this is an absolutely bioinformatic paper. So they took several problems similar to this one, and they analyzed the, the messages. And they came out with some, some very interesting observation. And there was, the, there was this particular uh, combination of letters, in here, uh, in E or D, something that doesn't need to be concerned, can be pretty much anything, or so we think, an L, and then so on and so on and so on. So this particular motif within this the information for an Epsin allows Epsin to bind to a receptor. But what and why here? So do you have Y there, or is this the word? No, because the Y is present in the receptor, okay? And, and this one is This one corresponds to ah, Epsin. okay, fine. Okay? So we were looking at, well, we, we did. <laughs> so at least these people were doing a bioinformatic analysis of the sequence of the Epsins and other proteins as well. So actually by, by analyzing the letters, the information in the sequence of these proteins, they came up with some similarities that came up with this motif. And actually, it was all theoretical at the moment. And we jumped, actually, and tried to see if this was true. And actually, we and others demonstrated that actually it's true. That particular motif that they identify is critical for the interaction of Epstein with the receptors. OK? So that, that definitely works. So but the, now what I'm asking is, what else is in there? So this is the, the sequence of Epsom. Okay, so these are the regions that they, the motif that are, it will describe a few seconds ago. We figured out what we think we did. What is the meaning of certain other parts of the message? So certain repetitions over here. We think we know what they're good for. And even some other messages. That's about it. From this complicated world that is called Epsom, we only know the 14% of the message, what it means, or, or so we do Okay, so there's a lot of things that, uh, believe me, I, I invest, and my students can tell, can tell I invest hours <laughs> looking at these letters and waiting for them to tell me a little bit, I mean, where there is a commonality, where there's something that's struck me. They don't tell me anything. So, um, why is it important to understand the Epstein message? Well, epsin is crucial for many different things, not only endocytosis. It seems to be very important for cell multiplication. So this is second necessary this here. It's a yeast cell. Usually it grows a bud. It's a budding yeast. The bud grows and finally separates. It generates two daughter cells. So under normal epsin function, you, that process occurs normally. So as you can see here, uh, uh, yeast cells that undergo this process and they divide. If you deregulate the epsin function, that doesn't happen as normal as in the other cells. So essentially what you see is cells that can, they grow very elongated buds, and they, these buds cannot separate. So the, the, 
the multiplication, the cell division of these cells is affected. So it's a very important thing. And actually, um, we know that this function is, is conserved in mammals as well. So uh, by using several strategies, we try to figure out how is Epstein doing this. And um, using the same approach I described uh, some time ago, it's like analyzing the phenotype, the, how they look like, introduce perturbations and look at that again and so on and so on. We actually, and actually Arpita, which is uh, sitting right there, I'm going to try to blank her with the, with the loop laser. So, figure it out that actually in this novel biochemical pathway that we are dis describing now, proteins that in mammals are important for leukemia participate. So this event seems to be involving some proteins that in humans are involved in leukemia. Also some parts of, protein we, uh, of the protein in, in yeast we recognize as being in common with certain other proteins that are involved in neurodegenerative diseases, like for example, Huntington disease. So, so they, they, this promise that there's going to be very exciting and important information coming out of this, of this uh, uh, experiment. And uh, we partially published some of these results, um, but we still want to understand that where this function resides in, in, the, in the Epstein world. What happens in mammals? So in mammals, for example, these cells that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation uh, that are, for example, involved in, in the gut uh, for the structure, epithelial cells, uh, are where the most aggressive cancers are being generated. So, uh, upon per uh, modifications and mutations in, in, the, in the genome of these cells, uh, we have very, very aggressive cancers. And uh, actually what we found is that um, if you overexpress, overproduce Epstein, these cells start behaving like cancer cells. So these cells are supposed to be very tight, binding to each other in a line. When Epstein is being overexpressed, this guy runs away. So, and, and it drags the whole colony with it. So this is called an invasive behavior. And that's done just by overproduction of this problem. So, and of course, the, the connection is with cancer invasion and metastasis. So we recently described this, but we want to know where in this part that information is encoded. If we could target that, if we could actually target the the region that is important for this behavior, it will be an extreme, it, it, it will be a breakthrough. Um, so I, I talk about overproduction of these endocytic products. What about when there is a deficiency in some of these endocytic products? So we are studying a disease that's, that fit into this pattern. It's called the Low Syndrome. So essentially Low Syndrome is a very sad disease. It, it, it includes mental retardation, cataracts in both eyes. So actually the children are born with bilateral cataracts for both eyes. And need to undergo surgery almost immediately. The, the most serious problem is renal dysfunction. And this is a mounting problem. They don't survive to the teen, the teens, okay? So they die very early on. So, so this is a very, very serious disease. And um, I don't have time to discuss some of the data, but we recently discovered the first cellular defects associated with this disease. So we have been working on this disease for a while. And that, uh, dif those defects are the ability of the cells from the patients to move and to spread. Let me show you just, uh, just in, a, in a tiny bit. So we published that recently. So for example, this is a normal counterpart. I, I don't think you can see anything, but cells are migrating from this point towards this, this direction, okay? So we can actually follow them, trace the trajectories, measure the velocity, and also what is called persistence of migration. So these cells are moving into this direction. They don't move toward this other direction. Why they don't do that? Because everybody's there, okay? They try to move where there is a space, okay? So that's a persistent and can be measured. It's essentially how linear these trajectories are. So when you look at cells of the patient, actually that's not what you see. So essentially they are slower, the velocity of movement is significantly below the normal, and they are not very persistent at all. So they essentially move backwards, sideways, 
and so they turn around. So, so they, they don't really follow a, a persistent trajectory. And if you even look at the behavior, it's a very abnormal behavior. So they generate this kind of blebs, these waves of membrane, which is absolutely abnormal. Okay, we were the first to describe the cellular phenotype in these patients. So there is also another defect which has to do with the ability to spread. So if you get a cell from a normal individual or a patient, we're suspended and let it land on a support. So the cell is round, it will land on a support, and as it lands, it spreads. So it adheres and spreads, try to occupy space. So if you turn this support 90 degrees like this, so that you can see it from above, it looks like a, something like, like this. Sort. So the nucleus is in the center, and the cell is expanding in all directions at the same time. Okay, it's trying to occupy space. Isotropic. Uh, exactly. exactly. So, this is what the normal cell will do. One of the normal counterparts we use. Has the same age, the same ethnic background as the patients. So, essentially, uh, this is uh, displaying uh, uh, this, uh, similar to the, the scheme before. So, you see the nucleus in the center is like a fried egg and it expands in all directions. And it starts to negotiate the space with the neighbors. So, neighbors over here. And so this guy is around here. You can see how dynamic and homogeneous the spread is. So this is what it happens with the patient. So this is one of the patients. So essentially, this guy cannot sustain isotropic spread. So he continuously retract. He tries again, but he cannot do it. He cannot sustain it. We think that this is one of the reasons why this patient had developmental defects. Because they cannot do what normal cells do. So, and actually, so they have all this movement of cytoplasm and so on, we call this the belly dance. And so, so you have other cells also around here doing similar kind of things. So it's a very abnormal phenomenon. How do we quantify this? We don't know. I mean, we have been trying to describe, I've been trying to describe, to they do this and they do that, they retract and they try, they snap. But we would will, we will love to have a, a way, a measurement of this how we can describe this versus this. So what kind of processing of images we could do. So I hope we can, we can interest you in, in collaborating with us in trying to figure it out what kind of patterns we can describe. Why do we want to do that? Well, first of all, because as I said, if we could have a quantitation of that, we could essentially introduce perturbations or remove perturbations and try to figure out what is wrong with this. But also, and very importantly, our lab just recently discovered that there is a biochemical connection between this disease, the low syndrome, with other ocular cerebral renal diseases. So we think if we could have a measurement of this def defect and compare different pathologies, we could figure it out which ones are more similar, which one cluster together, and therefore, which ones are undergoing a similar kind of uh, uh, biochemical uh, problems. So in, in conclusion, so essentially what, what, what we believe, what we feel, is that we need better theories, better, better methods to actually analyze the, the, the protein uh, message. So we don't know what else to look at. If this has taken a long time so to figure it out for us, only this 14% of the message of this product. Particularly what it has to do with product and product interactions. So is it, so coming to this one, mm -hmm. is, do you say that one of the reasons that you don't see it, because you're in the wrong space, what I say, is you are, on, you are looking at uh, too detailed description, I mean, on, on, on primary structure, basically, instead of going to somewhere that actually you might see certain pattern, because you, you, you might be actually on the wrong space, mm -hmm. the wrong, you are looking at the wrong thing, basically, I, it's too many combinations. Sure. So, it, it's true, this can be also mapped into, in some cases, with three-dimensional structures. Yeah. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, so it's true. Yes. And so in many, for example, for Epstein, at least a part, we have the structure. Uh -huh. So we can map one into the other. So the other part, it, well, is it, it special there? Yeah, actually that led to the identification of these two little 
letters here, y, y and T, which were extremely important. Actually, were very important to demonstrate why this protein is required for life, essentially. <laughs> so if you mutate these two letters, the protein is not capable of sustaining viability of yeast. So, so that was done based on the study. Without context, these two letters are not enough. You need a context, yes? It means, I mean... That was, the, that, was the, that was the way I used, enough. because this, that was in our lab. So that was, the, that was the, the, the way we decided to go on this. But we did way more than that. But, but anyway, it's true. But it, so in some cases, we have that information, the structure. Unfortunately, what it comes after this region, more or less, is completely unstructured. So when people cannot solve the structure of this because it keeps on moving, so it's, it, it has no structure. Okay. So, um, but on top of that, uh, I, I agree with you, and, and you're right. Okay. But in, in theory, in theory, the information for the folding of the product, the information of how what shape is going to acquire. What three-dimensional structure is going to have is here too, but we don't know how. To but we don't know. Point. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. We don't understand how these things work. So what people do nowadays is to try to solve the structures of things, and now they are desperately trying to look for commonalities. What it makes this protein to fold in this way and this other protein fold in this other way. So the message still is there. I agree with you, but essentially the information for the folding is here. So, so that, that's, that's, very, that's a very important uh, problem we have. We would like to be able to figure it out. What's the meaning? What, what we should be looking at? I think it's a perfect problem for the center right. It's mm -hmm. a perfect problem. Because actually, this is when you have some more complex information. Not in, <coughs> not in just, you cannot find it directly. It's not a simple transmission of it. It's more. And uh, there is space. somebody would like to pick it up, that'd be great. And mm -hmm. It's a very good problem. The other thing that we feel like we need is definitely a theory or a method to analyze patterns. So we, we can see that something is wrong here. We can see something is wrong here. But we would like to learn, for example, if we try to correct this or we look at another disease, how different it is, how similar it is. We cannot really tell based on just the observation. We want a quantitation of this. And we, can, we, we don't know how to do that. The same is for, for intracellular distribution of things, for patterns. Okay? So that's essentially uh, what we feel is our most important needs so far. So uh, I would like to finish then by just acknowledging the people in my lab. So Brian Kuhn, Kayao, which are my mammalian experts, uh, Arpita Sen, which is right there, like next to the Baratin. And David Eaton, which are my, my experts in, in yeast saccharomyces of this year, and Claudia, our, our research technician. And of course, I will, I will take every opportunity to thank our sponsors, NSF, and our partners in the industry, the SRU Biosystem, the Low Syndrome Trust. So these are the guys that have been funded, or have been funding the research I showed you in, 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 this, in this presentation. And of course, for your research. And thank you for, for your patience. If you guys have questions, I'll be more happy. Can you can you maybe email to the group uh, good introductory references for this, for even Wikipedia pages that would be relevant Absolutely. for this? Actually, we will put. Because uh, I really we want probably to have to put uh, Brad. We have to put all the slides because everybody almost has a slide. We should at least put the slide. Detail is one thing, yeah. but we have to put actually to link every slide for every talk that we have. Let's do it. So ask Marie and make sure that we have. So, so uh, I think we're happy to do both. Yeah. Okay. So we can do both eventually. So we need slide get from everybody. Put Some it references and, too. So we will have it. Any questions? So there are methods for analyzing two-dimensional shapes. So people in computer vision or human vision, there are some standard methods for measuring like how, how compact the shape is, how symmetric it is. So there are tools. They may not be sufficient, but at least they could provide some start. Uh, I, I would love to learn about those. So definitely we don't. I, until Arpita here, for example. I, I, I torture her with the statistics, OK? So she, she makes a modification on, on the genome of these cells. 
and you get a shit and I tell her, well, analyze a few hundreds of cells. That's one point, the percentage of the phenotype that you observe. Now you need to repeat it nine times so that we can use non-parametric statistics. <laughs> so she does that with her little eyes every day. You walk into the lab and she is measuring the size and <laughs> measuring the eyes. Like some of the, we show some, some of those differences across the, the shapes, the, the simple ratio of the area of the two-dimensional shape to the square of perimeter can very often classify the shapes into Sounds categories. So, yes. But again, it may not be sufficient, but it could be some stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there are a few books about patterns, actually. Yeah. Some of them are quite old. The question is, you know, who has time to read books? You have to talk to <laughs> someone. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Okay, thank you very much.